Well, welcome. And there's been a lot of discussion lately on mutation in the coronavirus. Is this going to alter the pandemic? Is this going to make it more transmissible? Is this going to make the disease more serious if you do catch it? Is it going to increase the pathogenicity and virulence of the virus? All remarkably good questions. And we're going to address that in this video. Now, this video is a bit sciencey, so I, I agree it's not for everyone. So if you don't want to watch it, I'm going to give you the bottom line now. Now, mutations do occur in these sorts of RNA coronaviruses, but usually at a fairly low rate. They're not rapid mutators like influenza or HIV that are rapidly mutating viruses. But mutations do occur and a mutation has been well documented and it's changed from a D form of the virus to a G form of the virus. Now, if you want to know what that means, you're going to have to stick around. But if that's all you want to know, it's changed from the D form, the original form in China, to the G form, which is causing all the havoc in the United States and Europe and various other places. Indeed, most other places in the world. So it's mutated from the D to the G. Now, does this make the virus more infectious? Does it make it harder to control is the big question. Well, there's experiments that have been done in the lab in vitro that suggest that is the case. But so far, this has not been well substantiated in vivo, in life, in the real world situation. So the overall answer to that question at the moment seems to be probably not. It probably is not making it more infectious and probably not making it harder to control. Even though it suggests that it would do that in the lab, in practice we haven't seen that yet. But there may be more evidence emerging on that, of course. But the answer at the moment seems to be probably not. And the other main question is, is this going to affect vaccines and therapeutics? Well, again, the answer there seems to be probably not, because there's been cross reactivity. Antibodies generated against the original D form also seem to work against the G form. And antibodies against the G form also seem to work against the D form. And of course, what a vaccine will do is stimulate the immune system to make the antibodies. So again, the jury is still out. We don't know for sure, but the answer is probably not. So the conclusion is that now we have a G type. It's called a, a G614 mutation pandemic. This is now the, the pandemic we are in. We have this new form of the virus. It's only a very, very small change. It's just one amino acid change, one little building block change. So it may not make too much difference. So that's the bottom line. It might not make too much difference. We're waiting for further evidence. Now, if you want to leave that there, that's fine. I've given you the main, uh, the main points there. But if you want to get the details on this, it is very interesting and there's quite a lot of things that we can learn uh, from it. So I would encourage you to stick around if you've got the, the time to do that. Now, um, this is published in the journal Cell, very reputable journal, making sense of mutation. What the D614G, that's the name of the mutation, means for the COVID-19 pandemic. And they give you the bottom line in the title. It remains unclear. But that's the name of the mutation. And we'll see why it's called that in a minute. The D614G is the name of the mutation. Now, the SARS coronavirus 2 has a low mutation rate overall, which is good. There's actually mechanisms in it which correct any mistakes that were made in the viral replication process. So that's good because part of the reason we can get uh, or we do get influenza A, for example, every year is that the virus, the influenza virus, is always mutating. So is the common cold virus, the rhinovirus, the most common common cold virus <laughs> is, is, the, is the rhinovirus. That's always mutating. That's why you can keep getting a cold. Then you get another one. Gets on your nerves. You can have like three colds in a couple of months some winters. It's, a, it's just a real nuisance. HIV. Well, we've had HIV since well, 30 odd years. 30 years? Probably more I've had HIV for. I think I first learned about HIV in about 80, 
82, I think it was. And no, in fact, even earlier than that, it might have been 1980. Anyway, we've had it for a long time and we still haven't got a vaccine. That's the, uh, that's the main point. We don't have a vaccine because it's a rapid mutator. But the SARS coronavirus, too, causing the current COVID-19 pandemic, is a slow mutator. So the, um, the, the, the prognostications are much better than for these other viruses. And we know that the uh, SARS coronavirus, too, emerged in China in late 2019, or some say uh, mid-2019. The draw is still out on that one as well. Now, virus mutations generally. Um, a virus mutation can become common through fitness or by chance. So what do we mean by that? Well, this is kind of a Darwinian thing. It's the survival of the fittest, isn't it? So if a virus is more transmissible, it's more likely to be propagated. It's fitter. And in, when we say fitter, we see what we mean is more able to reproduce. That's really what fitness means in terms of uh, evolutionary biology. So is this virus, virus fitter in that it's more able to transmit, therefore more, more able to reproduce? Or did this virus just get a lucky break? Is it just by chance? That's the big question. And it could be, it could be either. This is, this is sometimes called the founder effect in evolutionary biology. So someone will get to a particular country. He'll be the only person that will survive and therefore his genes will be propagated throughout a large number of people. It's the same kind of idea. So is this virus intrinsically fitter? Did it outcompete the original form? Or is it just probability and luck that caused it to, to get this break? So this new form of the virus emerged during the early part of the pandemic. And the change is an aspartate amino acid changes to a glycine amino acid. That is the only change. <clears throat> So the aspartate is represented by the D and the glycine is represented by the G. So the original form of this amino acid was a D614. Then when the mutation had occurred, that changed to a G614. That is the change. It is the change in one single amino acid. And it's the amino, the amino acid, this protein here, that this amino acid is in, is the protein that comprises the spike of the virus. So as you remember, this virus has a centre part like that, and it's got these spikes sticking out of it like this. So this is the protein, this mutation is in the protein that makes up this, these spikes, and the, these are important, of course, as these are the infective spikes. Now, what a protein is, is a protein is a chain of amino acids. So you have one amino acid there, linked up to another amino acid there, linked up to a different amino acid there. There's about 20, there's 20 of these amino acids, actually, linked up to a, a different one there, just using silly shapes here to represent the amino acids, linked up to another one there, so that's what a protein is. It's a long chain of these amino acids. So it forms a long strand of amino acids like that. But then these amino acids actually fold over and uh, form complicated uh, structures. Um, so it's, it's, it's more complicated. There's, this is what you call the primary structure. Then there's a secondary structure. And then they fold into a tertiary structure. C proteins are complicated things. Anyway, to get back to the point... This 614 refers to the 614th amino acid in this protein sequence. That's what it means. So the 614th amino acid in this protein sequence that makes up the spike protein has changed from aspartate, which is the D form, to glycine, which is the G form, just one amino acid change. And that is represented by one change in the base pairs in the RNA. It's just a single isolated mutation that's changed this particular amino acid. But we know that these spike proteins are important because it's these spike proteins 
that allow the COVID-19 virus to adsorb onto the cells that it's going to infect. So this is a cell it's going to infect. It's that spike protein binding onto this ACE2 receptor that allows the virus and the RNA to get in to start reproducing. So it's, it's a very small change, but it's it's an important part of the uh, the spike protein. The spike protein is an important part of the overall proteome of the virus for reasons of uh, infectivity and the infectivity of the virus. So um, what we're dealing with here is a dominant mutation variant at the 614th position of the spike. The S protein is the spike protein. So the old version was the D with a spartate amino acid at that 614th point. And the new version has got glycine at that 614th point instead of aspartate. That's the change. That's the only change. So six, G614 now, the new form, the mutated form. So that was the original form in China. And that's now changed to this form, which is now the main form in most places in the world. Most of the pandemic is now this new form. Now, G614 is most prevalent in many places around the world now. So basically, that is what's causing the pandemic now. Now, this guy here and his mates, et al., um, hypothesized that the rapid spread of the new form, the G614 form, was because it was more infectious and spread more rapidly than the old form, the D614 form. Therefore, what Corbett is saying is that the G614 outcompete, outcompeted the D614. That's his hypothesis. Now, why is he saying that? He's saying that because he's done experiments on the bench in, in glass, in, in, well, literally in glass, in, in, in vitro, that demonstrate that it is more transmissible, that the D form is more transmissible and causes more disease than the original D form. But that is based on lab-based experiments. Fortunately, so far, this has not transposed into real life infectivity and epidemiology. So it's an example of where the theory, well it's more than the theory, when the experiments in the lab aren't necessarily replicated in the real world uh, situation. So will D614G, will that mutation, which we now, of course we know is the G, it's the G form now, 614, uh, will that make outbreaks harder to control, the fact that it's changed from the D to the G form? Well, the great majority of SARS coronavirus 2 lineages in the United States arrive from Europe. So I'm afraid, and I extend extreme apologies, that most of the viruses circulating in the United States arrive from Europe and are of this G form, this new mutated form. G614 is the most common by far. And uh, it came from mostly from Europe. Now, over the period that the G614 became the global majority variant, the most common form of the virus, the number of introductions from China, where the D614, the D version, was still most prominent, were declining. The Chinese were getting their act together and suppressing the outbreak in China. Therefore, less forms of the virus were coming from China. But the mutated form that had already gone from China to Europe, that is the G form, is the form that spread from Europe to the Americas. Pity we didn't ban the flights earlier. So as the numbers in Europe were going up with the G form, the numbers in China with the D form were going down. So it could be that this G form just got lucky. It was in the right place at the right time. It was in Europe when there was lots of flights, very conveniently, to carry this virus to the Americas. Because make no mistake, this virus didn't walk there. It went there in an aeroplane, many aeroplanes, unfortunately. 
So um, is G, uh, the G form, G614, truly more transmissible in equivalent populations? If it is, then that is going to make the outbreaks harder, harder to control. It will make the virus more infectious in the real world situation. If it is in equivalent mixing populations. But right now, there's not enough data to say that. We actually don't know. And the fact that we don't know at the moment is encouraging because if it was an obvious overwhelming effect, it would have been easier to detect. We would have probably detected it already. So the fact that we don't know yet means that it's probably not that much more transmissible, I would think. So, but to be scientifically accurate, I would have to say we don't have enough data yet. We're not sure. Uh, will the uh, D to G mutation make the disease more severe? So the fact that we've now got the uh, the G614 uh, form rather than the D form, um, will that make infections more severe is the question. Well, again, in vitro, in the lab, it did look like that would be the case because it looked like in the lab, this G form was generating higher amounts of virus more quickly. The viral loads seemed to be higher in the cell cultures in the lab. Higher levels of viral RNA. And this does seem to feed through into patients as well, because there's data that suggests that patients with the D form do have higher loads of viral DNA. But what you have to remember here is that when we do these nasopharyngeal swabs, we're collecting the virus and doing a quantitative analysis of the virus from the upper airways. And it's not infection of the upper airways that causes severe disease. It's infection of the lower airways and the inflammatory changes in blood vessels that causes the severe disease. So the fact that we're detecting more virus in the upper airways, while it's potentially concerning, does not actually mean that it causes, that the G form causes more severe disease. It doesn't actually mean that. It could just be where the virus likes to live because there's no difference identified in hospital outcomes between people who are infected with the original D form or people now infected with the new G form. It doesn't seem to make a difference, which again is encouraging. Now, the last question is, will the uh, D614 to G, so does the, uh, the G, 614 form that was the D form. Um, will this impact on therapeutics and vaccine design is the next question. Because we want one vaccine that does for the whole wide world. We don't want a Chinese vaccine, an American vaccine, and a Mexican vaccine. We just want one. It's going to make things a lot more likely. Now, will it affect vaccines and therapeutics? It seems unlikely, which is also encouraging. Now, the actual D to G614 part of the protein, uh, the, the, the part of the protein at amino acid position 614, is not actually in the receptor binding domain, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. In other words... It's not in the part of the protein that directly binds on to the ACE2 receptors. Rather, it would be in part of the protein um, somewhere like here, which would not be binding directly. So it's not a direct binding effect. So, so to draw that in, in a bigger in a bigger format, imagine imagine that this is the uh, imagine that this is the uh, the spike here. Imagine that that's the spike there, the spike of the virus. And imagine this is the ACE2 receptor on the cell through which the virus will adsorb into the cell. So that's the ACE2 receptor on the cell. 
and that is the spike of the virus. So this particular 614 amino acid is not on this direct part of the viral spike that binds into this ACE receptor forming a bond or numerous bonds. Rather, this 614 position is on part of the spike protein which does not directly bind to the ACE2 receptor. So looks a bit fortunate that that is, that is the case. So the D, the, uh, the, uh, the 614G, that was the D, uh, the, the G614 is not in the receptor binding domain, the RBD of the spike protein. So this would be the receptor binding domain all along here, this bit that directly binds onto the ACE2 receptor. That would be the receptor binding domain. This is on another part of the spike protein. Uh, antibodies generated from natural infections. Um, with So antibodies generated from natural infections with viruses containing um, the original D or the later G form can cross neutralize. So what this is saying is that if someone has got, um, if you take antibodies from someone who is infected with the D form and give that to someone who's infected with the G form, the D form antibodies still act against the G form. And likewise, if you take someone who's made antibodies against the G form, inject those into someone who's infected with the D form, those G form antibodies will still be active against the D form. So there's cross reactivity. And of course, the whole point of a vaccine is to make antibodies. So it will be hoped that the antibodies made by or the antibodies that the vaccine stimulated the immune system to make would also be active against both forms of the virus. Uh, actual, actually, in fact, the, the, the actual cross-reactivity was not complete. It was actually about 93%, but that, that's, that's, that's pretty good. So it's not complete cross-reactivity, but looking promising. And of course, different viruses and di sorry, different antibodies generated by different vaccines will be active against different parts of the virus anyway. So <clears throat> that suggests that the locus, so the locus is this 614 position, that is the locus, the position of this changed amino acid is not critical for antibody mediated immunity. Looking good. The conclusion is that the, six, the G614 variant now is the pandemic. So actually, to tell you the truth, even if the vaccine didn't work against the D form, it wouldn't work too much because the D forms nearly died out now. Anyway, <clears throat> it's the G614 variant that is now the, uh, the main form causing the pandemic. So for sure there's these forms, um, there will be other mutations in the virus as well. We know there's other mutations in the virus. This one generated particular interest because it's in the spike protein, but it looks like we've got away with it, I think is the bottom line. I don't think it's going to affect transmissibility greatly, <clears throat> and I don't think it's going to affect um, infectivity, virulence, or um, therapeutics greatly. But we still need more evidence to be conclusive about that but so far it's looking promising <laughs>